Hello, and hello to you, Rich Evans. Hello, Michael. We're back. Uh, this is part three of our special review edition of Star Trek Discovery Talk. I don't even know what is this is. Is that the formal name? That's the formal name. <laughs> uh, this is, we've, we've, we've met three times over the season, the first season of Star Trek Discovery, yeah. to check in, to talk, and now that season one is concluded, we know exactly what happened, and now we can talk. <laughs> those, Insta- are, those are facts. Instead yes. of speculation, like, I'll, I'm for looking forward to see where it's going. Now we know where it went. <laughs> um, and, and now we can talk about it. On this episode of Review. Well, Rich, season one is done. And what was the point of season one? Uh, I don't know, like the overall point, like, like uh, let's blow things up, let's have a lot of war, let's have a lot of action, and then in the last ten minutes of the last episode, we'll we'll tack on a message that war am bad. Uh, we have this this we have many threads, major threads in this storyline, and it's it's a lot to to wrap your brain around because there's lots of little things going on. Major threads are uh, the Klingon War, obviously. Yeah. Um, Lorca, a secret asshole from the Mirror Mirror universe, who got to the the, the normal universe. I think they, they quickly said he, he flew into a gas cloud and magic happened. And he, I, f- I forget the, how he well, got here. It, they don't care. Yeah, I know. Well, that's the thing. He got to the regular universe somehow, and, and, and he spent his whole time in the normal universe cultivating, no pun intended, the spore drive yeah. pr- project so that he he somehow knew to go into 58 different spots and that would open the rift. Let's 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 just let's just rewind a little bit before we get into that that kind of specifics. All right. Okay. We the the opening of the second half is the mirror universe story arc. Captain Burnham. Welcome back to the Shenzhou. We made some modifications and replaced lateral vector transport systems. It's actually the most fun that the show was. I like, love like that ever. four-parter. It was, it was great. It was fantastic four-parter. And just the general, the, the concept of this Starfleet ship having to act like evil assholes, that's a beautiful idea. That was fun. Yes, yes. Tilly? As the the evil hard ass captain, that was fun. Tilly turned out to be, I think, one of my favorite characters. Yes. Um, because she was so, she's, I mean, kind of comic relief almost, but she's very relatable and human. She's like a less socially awkward Barclay. Yeah. Why don't you bring us all up to speed on your findings so far? Yes. I like Tilly and and Saru. Even though Saru isn't like you know personality overload, he's 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 the most Star Trek. Saru grew on me. Yeah, he grew on me when he first introduced and he that I my species senses fear. I thought that was so fucking stupid. But just as a character, mm-hmm. he grew on me all season. Um, you look back at the whole season, right? Yeah, and it's like cramming in well, a it's... lot of different things. We have this war, and then really when you, when you sit back and you think about it, um, what was the ultimate point of the mirror universe? It really, nothing. Yeah. Um, yes, it, it, it was a full, other than just for the fun of having a fun story arc, but now that that's over. Jumping into the, the, the battle of the binary stars right off the bat was kind of a detriment or a bad idea because they, I mean, obviously from a TV show perspective, they want to kick it off with a bang. Mm-hmm. Let's have everybody talking about this big opening and blah, 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 this big, but I think you needed two episodes, maybe three of Captain Giorgio and Michael Burnham and the crew of the Shenzhou going around mm-hmm. and doing Star Trek stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Start them off on, cause it's like, we didn't. We never got a sense of how that crew worked together. Yeah. How this this Star Trek universe felt. 
like they go, they're doing a science survey. I mean, I guess they, they did one scene where they went down and they rescued the eggs. Yeah. You know, one, well, it's not, it's not enough. Yeah, it's but, one scene. But the, ultimately, at the very end, they're like, we are, we are Starfleet, and we are proud, and we're going to do the right thing, and blah, blah, blah. And, and from an outsider's perspective, they never established that at the beginning. A handful of scenes at Starfleet headquarters, you know, so what's the business of Starfleet today? Well, we're going to uh, uh, meet this new species. You know, a little plot. A little yeah. plot. Yeah. Da -da -da -da, it ends. Next episode. Oh, we're gonna do this, and then bam, you hit him with the war. And I think that's why the uh, the Dominion War in Deep Space Nine was more impactful because even though that was a darker series, it it was it was like four seasons in, you know, and and then we see like all the horrors of war and all the terrible things that like everybody does, like Cisco and like all the things that happen that they have to do. Yes. You're asking me? You're the terrorist. I'm just a bartender. If Cisco finds out what you're the doing... The captain already knows what we're doing. We have his full support. And that's the, the it challenges the ideals of Starfleet, the war part. Um, there's even almost a civil war between the Federation and Starfleet. Remember that? I assume you'll be explaining to the public why it's necessary for Starfleet to seize control of Earth. Um, so that, I think that's what was uh, to a lot of like hardcore Trek fans. That was the turnoff. Was that like we said before when it started off, it felt like Starship Troopers, where it was like yeah. this really like kind of dark, like fast-paced, violent, very militant world. You mentioned Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine, the whole Dominion thing, war works for me because I think it's specifically the writers are. They're examining Star Trek's ideology. They're testing it. We had an agreement. I'm making a new agreement. If that program passes inspection, you walk free. But if there is even the slightest flaw, then I will send you back to that Klingon prison until Galran to take his time while he executes you. Discovery? I think they just want an action show. Are you saying the the the? the values and morals thing felt tacked on at the end? Oh, oh, I think it very much felt tacked on at the end, yes. What do you think about Michael Burnham's ultimate character arc? Th this, this, this is an important part yes. of the discussion because uh, my, my jaw dropped to the floor a few times during the final episode, <laughs> uh, especially when her, her loving mentor, Sarek, uh, was, was all on board for genocide. Yeah. Uh, and I went, what? Her initial mistake was being too Spockish, going, well, the logical thing to do is is to uh, capture this this bad guy, right? Yeah. And then that will make them look bad. So let's attack. Fuck you, I'm taking over the ship, I'm attacking, I'm doing the logical thing to stop this war. Really, she fucked everything up. Right. Uh, and then killed the guy out of rage and caused this whole war, right? Yeah. And so then we get to the end and Sarek and Cornwell are suggesting this radical course of action, which is violent. They're they suggesting to blow up Kronos. Yes, yes, uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then Michael Burnham's like, wait, you're gonna blow up this planet? There's like people here. That just like kind of deflates the entire Vulcan society and all their logic. Well, because the show doesn't care about Vulcans. Uh, this. This show cares about Michael Burnham, who I guess is supposed to be this amazing character that we all like and focus only on her character arc. And they don't care if it makes Starfleet and the Vulcans look like a bunch of hypocritical assholes. That's true, I guess. Maybe that's true. And I, I think ultimately the, the Achilles heel with Discovery is the character of Michael Burnham. She, that character never works for me. She's... In the, in, the, in, the, in the early episode, she's just arrogant and unlikable, and then she just becomes mopey and blank-faced. And she kind of remains largely just, I'm Michael Burnham. <laughs> that was a really good impression. I mean, I gotta give it to you. <laughs> she did a couple of things throughout the season. Um, I didn't much care for the love story between her and man who was a Klingon. Yeah. Ash Tyler. Well, they're, slash Volk. That's how they're trying to sell her turn. Like, you know, uh, what, now, now she, she realized, she, oh, she fell in love with the Klingon. Klingons are people too. No, we can't blow them up. That's, that's the catalyst for her arc. The problem is, 
She's playing it like a Vulcan. And you never really felt that I'm in, she's in love. She's in love because her, her performance is just so, I'm Michael Burnham. They won't make me care about you. She, yeah, yeah. It's just clearly restraining her emotions a little because of her upbringing. But yeah, that's a detriment to the, the drama in the show, I think. Yeah. And, and then, I mean, on top of the love story, which could have been a season arc, mm -hmm. uh, you have her and her relationship with Philippa Giorgio. Yes. Which is, she felt bad because Giorgio died. And then... She wants to bring her back by saving the evil empress. Which she was a psychopath. <laughs> yes. I mean. This is a Giorgio who was eating her friend earlier. That's a dark little touch. I have a dark sense of humor, so I could appreciate that. It's the same problem that uh, the Orville has. We're just the lead. The lead, the linchpin is like, it's the weakest part of the series. Because these side characters, your, your Tilly, your Paul, your Saru. I'm starting to really like these side characters. Yeah, yeah. Admiral Cornwall. Yeah, she's kind of a badass. Yeah. Uh, she's a, And you know what? She gets a pass because every admiral in Starfleet is wicked and evil. <laughs> so it's like, oh, okay. And Admiral, I'm afraid my choice is this. I can't let you start these experiments again. Admirals always, like, once you once you ascend from the captaincy to admiral, then it's like, oh, I'm gonna do dirty shit to save the Federation now. Now I'm not a captain. I can do, I can do nasty, nasty shit. You don't see anything wrong with what happened, do you? I don't like it. But I've spent the last year and a half of my life ordering young men and young women to die. I like that even less. I'm acting on orders from the Federation Council. How can there be an order to abandon the Prime Directive? That's that's the running gag in Star Trek. Yeah, is that um, is that admirals always have some kind of dirty secret? Belay that last order, Helmsman. One hundred and eighty degree turn, hard about. We're going to attack. Speaking of Star Trek cliches, you got the evil admiral who who does sketchy things. And no matter committing a crime, mutiny, stealing a starship, you know, sabotage, whatever, as long as you save the day in the end. <laughs> as long as you save the Federation, it's yeah, okay. The, the, yes, or the Earth, the Federation, whatever, they'll, they'll, they'll pin a medal on your chest and, <laughs> and, and give you your, your uh, rank back. Because like, like Captain Picard, they're like, don't stay away from the Borg battle, Captain Picard. I'm about to commit a direct violation of our orders. Any of you who wish to object should do so now. It will be noted in my log. Then first contact happened, and they time traveled and saved the planet Earth. No, nobody even asked them about it. <laughs> to hell with our orders. He didn't get the little <laughs> trial like Kirk had in the voyage home. <laughs> Captain Kirk, you're charged of all these fucking crimes. Oh, Kirk also got a new ship. Yeah, he got a new <laughs> ship. But because you figured out that whales needed to talk to a space sausage. <laughs> Your rank is fully reinstated. Well, technically not fully reinstated. He was an admiral. He was reduced in rank. That's what captain. he wanted, though. They That's were doing all him a favor. He got everything he wanted in the end, but he deserved it. He saved the Earth. Even though they, they stole a starship and blew it up. Death to Federation property. <laughs> Physical assault to Starfleet officers. Creating and blowing up a planet. <laughs> you solved our whale problem. Everything's oh, okay. So, so in true Star Trek, you gave Earth transparent aluminum technology a hundred years before they should have had it. Violated the Prime Directive, <laughs> the Temporal Prime Directive. Um, y yes, yes, eh, it's fine. It's fine. Um, Admiral, I am. The Kuma. The We didn't. We didn't talk about. We didn't talk about Ash Tyler much. Is there much to talk about? They turned him into a Klingon, or they turned a Klingon into him, or they merged them both. I'm not. I'm not sure what the fuck happened there. That's a very good question. Um, they took Volk and turned him into Ash Tyler. I think Ash Tyler had died. Okay. And they did some kind of memory graft into, like, remember she had those gloves yeah. on and she's doing a thing? Um, 
And then they like did surgery on his head. Volk, uh, it sounded to me like they're just taking parts of Volk and integrating them into Ash to make it like no. a combo. I think Volk entity. Volk, they, they're like your your limbs have been cut and shortened. Okay. Your fingers okay. have been sawed down. I think they took Volk and and made him look like a human and implanted his brain with with memories from Ash. Okay. I mean, they did a really good job. Like surgery. Wouldn't they be able to tell with just the DNA? Well, the doctor did look into it, but but they were so good at it that they like were they very... went in and they surgically altered all of the DNA. Yes, yes. This 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 warrior race culture is very good. <laughs> at it. That hates science. That hates science. <laughs> science is for fools and weaklings. Use our science to make the ultimate spy. <laughs> <laughs> we have the most sophisticated and advanced technology ever invented in the universe. No, let's headbutt each other and eat raw meat. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, the Klingons are dumb. It's true. I, I like to believe that somewhere like underground in some some like secret place, they they have like just thousands of just really smart Klingons with like glasses. They're just doing work. <laughs> And They're that, just in charge of the, everything. The warrior guys like kind of look the other way. <laughs> like, like remember when that one gremlin got real smart? <laughs> the brain gremlin. Yeah, yeah, the brain gremlin. Tony Randall. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he, he's, they have like thousands of Klingons like that. Oh, I don't mind if you say. What, what do you say we work on this new project about space? And do, you, do you remember the TNG episode where like Beverly Crusher was running her little think tank? Oh, and yeah. there was a there was a Klingon scientist who was like super insecure and traumatized. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone beat me up. Jurak was a warp field specialist on the Klingon homeworld. I don't think Klingons regard scientists very highly. She always seemed a little defensive. <laughs> Somewhere there are Klingons that do research into all this stuff. And they get absolutely no respect. They get absolutely no respect, but they provide all the warriors with the tools they need. To, to kill and murder and create mayhem and terror in the universe. Starfleet should be able to wipe the Klingons out so fucking easily. So fucking easily. It's a coalition of some really smart people who are constantly working on science. The Klingons should never have gotten into space. No, no, really, they shouldn't have, no. If, if anybody's gonna conquer the Federation, it'd be someone like the Romulans. Yes, Laurel holding the Klingon Empire hostage with an iPad. Yeah. That's connected to a bomb that was placed inside their planet by the Federation. Look, 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 look. She's gonna last about 10 minutes. I don't care. As the, as the new uh, leader. I don't give a shit. You're it, glad it, it's over. It fucking ended the dreary, joyless Klingon war. And now maybe, maybe after all of the criticisms, maybe we'll get something that feels more like Star Trek next season. What I need is for all of you placid people to finally start listening. We have all mourned the enormous loss of life due to this war. The acts of violence committed against us are the acts of a foe without reason, without honor. Rich, when, when, when they said Admiral Cornwell is sending this evil space, space witch down to a planet with a mysterious device and they're looking for volcano holes, uh, uh, the first thing I thought was, oh, they're gonna throw some kind of bomb down there yeah. to reignite all the volcanoes. And Michael Burham's like, what are they, what are they up to? <laughs> Come on! What do you think they're up to? They want to blow the fucking planet up. Like, that was the we biggest- born yesterday? The biggest non-twist of all time was that, that when that was revealed to be a bomb. Yeah. Like, till he opened the case, like, didn't you know? <laughs> didn't you fucking know? We were looking to throw this thing down a volcano hole. <laughs> uh, they kept saying they're inactive. It's gonna, it's gonna map the volcanoes. And so we can figure out a strategy. Even now. though the Discovery, which is supposedly already in a cave on Kronos, could probably do the same thing with its powerful sensors. We're gonna do it with this suitcase bomb. I mean <laughs> drone. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all true. I'd be more annoyed that Starfleet was down with this plan. 
but I never remember this isn't Star Trek. This is space adventure show in space. Yeah, well, it is, it so, is disconcerting that Starfleet was down with this plan. I offer a thought. He will triumph who knows when to fight and when not to fight. You remember in TNG when Riker had that little test on the, the, the planet of the ancients with the, he was fighting the Ferengi and he said, no, we will treat our enemies well, even though it might risk our own survival, but that's price of our ideals. I guess let's talk about the elephant in the room. Okay, go ahead. At the very end of the first season, they get a distress call. And I was like, uh, I was like oh no. <laughs> and they're like, it's a, spa it's a Federation ship. USS E. And you know that. And, and, yeah, and, you know, <laughs> and then they're like, NCC 17. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, oh no. You knew when you just saw four blank numbers yeah. spots that it was going to be 1701. Yeah, when they said they were getting a distress signal, I was like, oh. I thought it was going to be like, um, like, we're getting a distress signal. Oh, it's time to begin our next journey. We, uh, they run into, I mean, 10 years earlier, the, the, the USS Enterprise 1701, not A, the classic TOS ship commanded by Christopher Pike uh, and Science Officer Spock and First Officer Lady. Um, oh yeah, Majel Barrett. Majel Barrett, but I, I forget her character name. She's I do all, too. Just in that one episode. She's just in but, the cage. Um, yeah, and so here comes the ship, and then they show it, and they kept in in canon and continuity when they had um, uh, Constitution class ships in Next Gen. Constitution class. Hi. Deep Space Nine. in Enterprise, yeah. uh, and it looked just like it, but then now it's like, kind of looks like it, but it's a little different. And I'm well, like, oh no, what are they gonna, uh, how are they gonna show the bridge? How are they gonna, it's, is it gonna look like a space bridge from the future, like? Yes, it will, and I don't give a shit. Of course they're gonna change it. They're not gonna have it look like the 60s set, you know that. And uh, this is the kind of thing I don't give a fuck about. I will critique the design though. The, that, that fucking original Enterprise, what stands out about that ship is just how sleek and simplistic and, and elegant it is. It's, a, it's just a swoops and they just put windows and shit all over it. It just fucking ruins the look. But yeah, they kinda, it's kind of a mix between the two types of ships. So, yeah. I mean, it's like, okay, fine. If, if you have a great story for season two, bring in Pike, but I mean, they went that whole season without fan service. And then in the last like 10 seconds, even the end credits, they played the 60s music. I know. Why? Because they want you to tune in next season and they want you to keep paying for CBS All Access. I, I'm, I'm starting to, uh, I'm rewatching Deep Space Nine again, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I remember the very first time I watched Deep Space Nine, uh, when it first came out. And I was like, what's going on? Like. <laughs> This is this is really weird. There, there's all these strange people I don't know. There's this there's this man who looks like a ghost who's made of liquid. There's this very angry Bajoran lady. There's garbage everywhere. Cisco is like mad. He's bitter. He doesn't want to be in Starfleet. He's like, I'm thinking about going into the civilian service. Fuck Starfleet. You know, mm -hmm. I killed my wife. You killed my wife. You prick. <laughs> uh, and then the Enterprise. I remember the Enterprise leaving. Uh -huh. And I was like, don't go. Don't go. I don't know any of these people. Don't leave me with them. You're leaving me with strangers. You're like a, you're like yeah. a kid being yeah. like, your, your mother dropped you off at kindergarten for the first time? Yes. <laughs> she left like, you all alone. No! I said, come back, Captain Picard. Come back, warm, comfy <laughs> Enterprise with your bright lights and, and your holodecks. And there's garbage everywhere. Why hasn't anybody cleaned this up? Jake Sisko doesn't have a bed. <laughs> Dad. There is nothing to sleep on in there except for a cushion on the floor. But but they had, they were like, bye, TNG's done. Saddle up, get involved in this now. You know, yeah. only when they brought 
Thomas Riker back in, really? And I think they had Worf an episode with eventually. Well, Worf eventually. They were on their they were on they were they were their own show at that point. They they were they didn't need Worf. It was just like, ah, Michael Dorn's free. Everything crossed over at some point, you know, Spock, the unification stuff. Yeah. Um Scotty episode. I think there was a Bashir Data crossover at some point. Um so there was always little bleed overs here and there. Fine. Well, it could just be another four because they they like arcs. It could just be a four episode story. I, I guess, don't know. I guess. I, I it just felt like TOS now is is feeling like AT-ATs to me and Star Destroyers and Death Stars. You know what I mean? Where it's like, remember this? Remember this? Yes. I mean, it's felt like that since uh, 2009, where it's Spock, Kirk, remember them, remember them. And it's like, I want Discovery completely free and clear of that. They mention, they mention well, Jonathan Archer at one point, that's fine, but <laughs> just do your own thing. Too bad, Mike. <laughs> get, get ready for Spock as the new captain of the Discovery, and he's gonna fuck up, and Michael Burnham's gonna be all smarter than Spock, and then Spock's gonna get demoted back down to commander or or step down, and then uh, that's gonna be their 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 reason to give uh, Michael Burnham the captaincy. Well, they know they were going to Vulcan to get their captain. They were going to a place to get their captain, and. They caught a distress signal. That's true. So I don't think That's Spock's true. gonna be the captain. You might be right about that. I think they're gonna I think they're gonna go off course in a plot thread before they get their new captain. Let's give them a little taste of what the Discovery's capable of. Lorca. Tell us about Lorca. Lorca is the the evil captain. Well well, he is the the, the morally gray captain. He he is harsh. He wants to blow shit up. Um, he, you know who he reminds me of? I know who you're gonna say. You know exactly who I'm gonna say? Yeah. When Picard got captured by the Cardassians and saw the four lights, Captain Hardass took over the Enterprise and he, was, he wasn't like Picard at all. He was kind of harsh, he had his own ways, he didn't like Riker, but he still got the job done and he was a good character. Let him stew for a few minutes, then go in and tell him that you've convinced me to meet with him one more time. Tell him I'm a loose cannon and that he needs to be more reasonable because I'm such an unreasonable man. Lamech will want to bring his own aides on board. Pretend to be worried that I'll object and then give grudging permission for two aides. No more. Understood? Aye, right, sir. Right, sir. That was the beautiful episode of TNG that just subverted like the evil Admiral trope, like the new authority figure from Starfleet, they're evil. He comes in, you think that's what they're doing, but no, he's just right. Yeah, yeah, he just had a different way of commanding. Yeah. He just, he didn't tell everybody what he was doing. He made, he just wanted people to follow his orders and, and he was effective and it was odd to see that. Yeah, and so he's memorable. And Lorca was the same way. Like, yeah. They they find the diplomacy uh, missions kind of boring, and then when it comes to war, they're like, "All right, let's do this thing." Like, nah. Um, and so Lorca felt like that at first. Yeah, before before the twist, I like the whole uh, PTSD angle. You know, where you know he was wounded by the the Klingons, his ship got blown up, his eyes were injured, and he had it out for them, and he was hiding it. To give the lining, the lack thereof, a recent battle injury. It's a time of war. This whole story takes place at a time of war and people reveal themselves uh, under that kind of duress. I like to think it makes me mysterious. But then we discover he's doing science experiments in his basement. Because he's an evil mirror universe duplicate. I, as fun as the mirror universe storyline was, it, it kind of just destroyed Lurka as a, as a character. It was, one, it, was, it, was, it was one of the best parts about the show, but now he's just gone, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And well, I like that actor a lot too, um, they'll, Jason they'll, Isaacs. They'll bring him back. It won't be it won't be the same Lorca. It'll be the original Lorca. I don't think from, they'll bring him back. You don't think they're gonna do that? That's a speculation, but I don't think they will. Okay. I don't know what happened to the good Lorca. They they say he died, right? Uh, actually, the reason I think they might bring him back is because they didn't say he died. Uh, Admiral Cornwall's got a line like, "Well, there's no way one of our people would survive on their own in the mirror in universe." Yeah. So they imply he's somewhere alive in there. They think he's dead, but he yes, could show up at right. any moment. That's right. But he's got to get out of there. Yeah. Speaking of mirror, mirror, while we're back on that topic, I, I think I noticed what may have been a mistake or, or, or uh, uh, oversight. I wanted to talk about Commander Landry. Okay. I don't know if you remember her. My name's Commander Landry. I'm Chief of Security here. 
See, we're unloading all kinds of garbage today. That was Lorca's right-hand lady. Um, oh, yeah, she, yeah, the, she the, went secure, down, the original security officer. Yeah, she went down into his, his space lair, and she was mean mm -hmm. and kind of evil. She wanted to let the tardigrade, she was like, we gotta find out why it's so violent. I gotta, uh, and, um, and then she ended up getting mauled to death by it. Mm -hmm. And and him and her were like like winking at each other and all that. And then we go to the Mirror Mirror Universe, and there she is, and she's evil. <laughs> Maybe I, she's one of those unfortunate people who's like evil in both universes. I, I, that's just how I took it. Or maybe she's just slightly less evil in the Mirror Universe. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> it's just a grade. I mean, I guess everyone in the real universe aren't necessarily good, right? Oh yeah. Are you annoyed? I'm annoyed that they have the Force now that they have this fungus that connects all life in the universe and your soul goes into the fungus when you die. Um, one can argue that that might not have been reality. Hallucination, you, okay. It's possible, like, like that's what Stamets was imagining him to say kind of thing. I'm just gonna be annoyed if Star Trek has force ghosts now. If, if, if Dr. Hugh comes back uh, in, in, in Paul Stamets' waking dreams, or in, yeah. in a spiritual form. I'm, I'm part of the mycelial network. And he kind of phases in and out. It's where you go when you die. Then, yeah. They're gonna do it. They're gonna, the mycelial <laughs> network, it's a force that connects all life in the universe, Mike. Well, that's, a, that's another question too in season two. Are they gonna continue flying around with the spore drive? Well, they gotta find some way to get rid of the spore drive. Well, they, don't, they don't really give a shit about continuity, I guess, ultimately, yeah. but. Obviously, it's, there is no spore drive beyond. It's it's never even fucking mentioned. You think you think Voyager would have brought it up? Yeah. Hey, you know they did this thing a hundred years ago. <laughs> it's in our databanks. Do you remember that spore drive that was super useful for getting across the galaxy? <laughs> Jane Janeway's back on Earth, and she's just like, she's reading this life story, <laughs> and she goes. Why didn't anybody bring this fucking thing up? <laughs> I really enjoyed the Klingon Sleaze planet. <laughs> I guess that was Kronos. Kronos. But uh, they, they go to a, like a sleazy city. I thought that was fun. A splash of uh, uh, Moss Eisley. Yes, yes, a little Star Wars, yeah. a little Star Wars. Um, until he smoking drugs with fucking Clint Howard. Yeah. Uh, the baby from- <laughs> From the uh, original series. From uh, uh, fucking Corbinite Maneuver, right? The, the, I don't yeah, ah. think so. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's three years old, he still looks like Clint Howard. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> he is an ugly, ugly man, but God bless him. And really like, the Klingon War wasn't over overly done, but I was like that last episode. The, it really kind of like eh, we got to wrap everything up. Um, yes, but I'm, I'm ultimately though I am glad it's over. So yeah. I can't complain. No, it's good that it ended and it didn't drag out into season two. I was expecting um, I was expecting a retcon of the entire war. I don't know if that might have been too crazy because. They used the spore drive when they got back to the regular universe and they accidentally jumped nine months in the future. Mm -hmm. So I figured Stamets, which he really didn't do anything in the final episode, I figured he would be like, I can figure out how to make us go nine months back. Oh yeah, yeah, I was waiting for that too. And then I was like, okay. And then Michael Burnham's like, okay now, I can stop myself from making the stupidest decision ever. You know what I mean? Well, you, you sent me a text because you'd seen it before. You saw the last episode before I did. You said that was stupid. I was expecting that. Okay. I was fully expecting the time travel to just completely wipe out everything that happened this yeah. season. Yeah, because essentially they're like the entire Federation has been defeated. And I'm like, oh, this is some doomsday stuff. This is some yesterday's Enterprise stuff mm -hmm. where we can fix this with space. <laughs> we can fix this with time travel, right? Right. It's like if yesterday's Enterprise Star Trek just continued on from that. <laughs> the Federation's gonna be dead in, in six months. You know, that gives them a reason to build a whole fleet of Constitution class starships, right? Because everything's blowed up. Um, but yeah, and, and I really pictured, 
uh, Michelle Yeoh, aka Philippa Giorgio, and Evil Empress having having a fight. On, on, on other sword fights yes. at the end of the show. <laughs> And then the good Giorgio kills the bad one. Okay. And then she's back. Or maybe you don't know who won. Maybe that's, oh, that's a tease. Uh, yeah. Well, I think you'd find out pretty quickly when one starts eating Saru. <laughs> <laughs> like looking back at it, it's it's like this this kaleidoscope of stuff that I thought was was really good or really bad and really off, but also really on. I mean, you know, do you have that same kind of feeling where it's like, it's like they crammed so much. Like if you look back at next gen season one, yeah. like at least like simple little stories and nothing like major happens. Nothing major happens in next gen until season three, four, you know, same with Deep Space Nine. It's just like, it feels like we had war, we had mirror universe. We had like, there were very few away missions too. Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't like a lot of problem solving. It was it was very it was high, almost almost no problem solving. Um, very high concept, high drama. Even even when the show works, like like the mirror universe stuff, it doesn't work like Star Trek normally works, where it's people figuring stuff out, people talking their problems out. It worked like when it worked, it worked like a good action adventure show. Yeah. Like the good episodes felt like they could be Farscape episodes. I don't think you've ever watched much Farscape. No, no, no. That's a really fun show about space fugitives who run around and they get into adventures. Okay, okay. And you know, it's some fun action, but it doesn't feel like Star Trek. Okay. Discovery for me is like, it's constantly just, well, maybe it'll get better. Well, maybe I'll, I'll keep watching. Maybe I'll watch more. I right, well, maybe I'll watch more. I'm always on the verge of not giving a shit and just turning it off. It started to grow on me a little more. I I don't even view it as a Star Trek show really anymore. I view it as just an episodic drama. It's not Star Trek. It is an action adventure show. It's just, it's not like the best one ever, but it's, it's passable. It's a passable action adventure show with spaceships and laser guns. Locked on, Captain. Fire Mr. Reese. Aye, sir. I think for television, it's it's quite well done in the visual effects and the, the style and the, the art and all that stuff. Okay. Star, Star Trek used to be a set of ideals, but now Star Trek is names you know and places you know where people can shoot at each other in those places. <laughs> I know the mirror universe. They're gonna shoot people there. I know Quonos. <laughs> They're gonna put a bomb in there. <laughs> I know Starbase. Go <laughs> boo boo. <laughs> what? Uh, it's Captain Christopher Pike. Didn't I joke about them running into Pike in the last episode? <laughs> and then here comes a Constitution class ship. <laughs> it says Captain Christopher Pike of the Starship Enterprise. That would be insane. I just want to see, I just can't wait for the violent shootout that's going to happen on the, the, the 1701 Enterprise. Oh, I have a theory. Yeah? The 1701 Enterprise, the bridge is completely like destroyed because of some kind of accident or, or incident. Yeah. And then that that's going to say, well, we're going to have to rebuild this whole bridge. <laughs> No, no, you know what's Maybe we should look at, make it look like a terrible 1960s set. I'll tell you exactly what they're going to do. What's that, Rich? 1701. We're going to see how Pike gets mauled. And then we're going to see or hear about Kirk being appointed the new captain. Uh, Pike doesn't get mauled. He gets irradiated, I believe. Irradiated? I think he... We'll see that, and it'll be just like the ultra-violent version of whatever they said happened. What's his problem, Commodore? Inspection tour of a cadet vessel. Old Class J Starship. One of the baffle plates ruptured. The delta rays? It depends on how, I think the cage took place like uh, nine years-ish before. Okay. 11 years, four months, five days. And and so you'd have to go back to Menagerie uh, and kind of like go what, like think of the timeline. Sure. Not that they'll pay any attention there to that. That's what but they're about. Was it 10 years before the I original series? I think so, series? yeah. 11 years, four months, five days. They'll fudge it enough. We'll so see. Maybe we'll see. We'll see Pike at mold. The Delta Rays. Uh, with, with lots to talk about for season two, Rich. Kirk's that thing you know. 
Kirk and Spock. Kirk, welcome to the bridge of the Enterprise. Oh my God, what if Kirk ends up being the new captain of Discovery? Like they change the timeline? No, it's like he- Oh, he... you think Kirk will be the new captain, but then plans will change after Pike gets mauled. The Delta Rays? That's not a bad. I'm Captain Kirk, I'm taking over the Discovery, and we're gonna do this adventure all season, and then, uh, you know, Captain Pike gets irradiated and turned into a wheelchair man, and now I've gotta go command this other ship. Yeah. Then they could have Kirk as the captain for five, six, seven, eight episodes. Yeah, yeah. Why not? Why the fuck not? <laughs> well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see when season two of Star Trek Discovery starts up uh, in the fall. How does it feel to have lived long enough to see all of your favorite franchises go down in flames? Feels great. <laughs> <laughs>